So I'm amazed how you are still listening my lectures regarding the chapter 4, but I'm positively pleased that you keep on doing it. So this lecture will be about dipole radiation, and I would like to point out here that we will also be um, explaining a little bit that in addition of just being happy of having electromagnetic waves in propagating in space or inside a medium, we also would want to understand at some point at least how this kind of radiation is being given to birth. So what are the instruments and what are the physics that gives rise to electromagnetic radiation? And this is the, exactly the lecture that I will try my best to elucidate those different uh, points. So what gives rise to radiation and, and how we can, as a mankind, come up with means of, of giving rise to light and light sources. So this is what I will be speaking about. And in the end, I will be showing you the most common or most important source of electromagnetic radiation or more precisely of, of light. So electromagnetic radiation of specific wavelengths. And that is essentially a dipole source, a dipole radiator dipole moment like a, inside a molecule fluorescent molecule that gives rise to a dipole field electric dipole radiation pattern and that is the kind of if if radiation pattern of any kind of sources you should like remember after this course like this this type of a radiation pattern is the one you should remember since like basically all the other sorts of radiation patterns can then be built, constructed by using electric dipole radiation patterns, essentially. That's almost the truth, even when we generalize things further, for example, into different kinds of radio wave antennas and so forth. So this is what I will be speaking about in this lecture, and I will now actually get started. So, as we all know, based on the basic principles of electrodynamics, what gives rise to light and electromagnetic radiation, well, essentially it's those source terms in, in the Maxwell's equations. And, and since we are interested in propagating fields and not just electrostatic fields, it is actually the moving or accelerating electric charges that gives rise to light. So essentially it could be, for example, oscillating electric charges that give rise to electromagnetic radiation. And then this is different from the case of when we have an electrostatic field. So when an electron is essentially just stationary somewhere. But now we are interested in actually radiation. And that requires that we have moving charges. We have a current. And in addition to that, that has to be accelerating or, or oscillating. So that they or decelerating would be another word of de describing the types of motion that we need that gives rise to our light. So, we need a current density J that is non-zero and also is time-dependent, so that they, if you would calculate the partial time derivative of J, the electric current density, we would have non-zero. And this is the, the source term that acts inside the wave equation and gives rise to waves. So this will be the source term in the differential equation forming the wave equation. And depending on the wavelength range, uh, radiation, can be created by different kinds of phenomena and different approaches can be used. So for example, of course, in our context of optics, we do not deal much with UV radiation or X-rays or gamma rays, but at least this is good for you to know. When we go into the shorter wavelength ranges, there typically we are using larger instrumentation. For example, it could be accelerators, cyclotrons, synchrotrons, particle, particle accelerations, uh, sorry, accelerators and, and more modern instrumentation would be free electron lasers that then would give rise to UV, X and Röntgen rays. So this is what can be used. X-ray tubes is another common use device in the kind of hospital environments. So we don't even need like very bulky devices at some point. Other regime is visible light and, and this is mainly our regime of interest in this course. 
And here we have plenty of different kinds of lasers that can be realized. We have light emitting diodes, so LEDs. We have the semiconductor based LEDs. And we also nowadays have organic LEDs, so organic LEDs that give rise to light. And then we used to have back in the days when I was young incandescent light bulbs. So essentially there was a, a heated filament inside the glass bulb and that gave rise to thermal radiation and also a tiny bit of light emission. And that was what we were using to lighting, light up our homes and apartments and, and buildings and, and streets and everything. But nowadays, of course, things have progressed and it's really the LEDs that are used in most of the time. And this is kind of main sources of light when we are looking at the visible uh, light wavelength ranges. Lasers, LEDs, light bulbs, and of course fluorescent emitters if you're looking more into kind of like atomic scale of things or quantum dots that can be formed using semiconductors. Another regime would be infrared radiation. And when we are thinking about sources of infrared radiation, first thing that comes to my mind are thermal sources and, and radio waves for radio wave antennas. And of course, when we go into the larger scale or longer wavelengths, cosmic background, we cannot avoid that. So that, they, that, for example, is another type of an example of infrared radiation. But I would like to highlight here that the thermal sources, that's a one, one like a nice thing to remember when we're thinking about infrared radiation. And then in connection to incandescent light bulbs, we can see that the, the old style light bulbs also, they gave rise a lot of thermal radiation, recalling the, the black body radiation law. So these are the different regimes. And I will next highlight a little bit about different kind of instrumentation that can be used to realize specific types of uh, light sources or, or sources of EM radiation. So when we go to the shorter wavelength regime, and we are not now in the visible light regime anymore, but rather we are going to the shorter and shorter wavelengths. Uh, what kind of instrumentation can be used? Well, we could use cyclotrons. So essentially we are then accelerating uh, charged particles using electric fields. And then we are guiding the charged particles using magnetic fields. And then we can make a compact device. And at the end of our acceleration, we have a, a lot of particles, charged particles that are in, in quite, uh, they have quite high velocities. And when we hit other, other solids, for example, a piece of a metal, with these high velocity particles, then brain strahlung, so breaking radiation, uh, basically gives rise to short wavelength radiation. A little bit more sophisticated way and also a little bit more bulky way of, of getting radiation out are synchrotrons. And in there, the radius of curvature does not change anymore for the charged particles, but rather it's being intact. So thinking of the Lorentz force law, so F equals Q, the charge of the particle times the velocity and the cross product of the B field. When we are increasing the velocity of our particle and we want to do that, since we want to accelerate the particles, we must also modulate the magnetic field in order to keep the, the radius of curvature the same. And this is where the name comes from, synchro. So the, the radius of curvature is being synchronized. So when we accelerate particles into larger velocities, the radius of curvature is being kept intact. And, and, and this is the kind of instrumentation that is being used inside synchrotrons. And incidentally, these synchrotrons, like, okay, they are beautiful instruments, but they're also quite large. So they are really uh, very, very high power, uh, high energy instrumentations that we can accelerate particles into a mega electron volt regime. And subsequently, when we are using these particles to give rise to electromagnetic radiation, the radiation is quite energetic. But these nowadays, the synchrotrons and their sizes, they range in the kind of several kilometers in, in diameter so that they are quite bulky. And, and synchrotrons are ones that can be in, in considerably smaller in size. So you can even realize a synchrotron that is, is just of the order of some tens of centimeters in size in principle, the radius of curvature, but in synchrotrons, uh, particles are really being accelerated into a considerably uh, 
at, at using considerably larger radius of curvatures. So these are the some examples, and in the end, in a way, one could say that it's the Bremsstrahlung coming from the Germanic word, German word uh, breaking radiation that they, that can be used to create UV, X-ray, and, and gamma rays. So very energetic photons can be created with these kind of sources of radiation. But they are bulky and they are expensive, so it's not even the case that every country has a synchrotron, but rather uh, there are collaboration, large national, international collaborations in terms of getting time for the synchrotrons. Smaller devices, and these you can find in, in most of the, the advanced larger hospitals, are X-ray tubes. So and there, like a, how 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 branch traveling is being realized, is that you heat up a, some piece of a material, and when you heat up the material, electrons start being being moving out from the material, and then you have moving charges, sorry, uh, charged particles, and then you can accelerate them by having static electric fields. And when these accelerated electrons hit hit a material, then then X-ray emission is being given uh, given rise. So this is a very common way of, of making X-rays in a kind of smaller scale, and it's not very expensive instrumentation. And and the kind of the downside is that the brightness of your source is not very very bright. So you can realize a, a lot more brighter sources using synchrotrons. Uh, sorry, cyclotrons and uh, synchrotrons. And here, uh, I believe these free electron lasers are, are called so forth, so called fourth generation of, of uh, particle sources and, and subsequently EM radiation. And in here, you are not uh, well, the kind of oh, way how, how do you generate radiation with free electron lasers is slightly different from the, the mechanism than, than just breaking radiation so that they, you, you in fact you, you are kind of modulating the electron oscillations and subsequently they, they start radiating radiating UV light and Röntgen line and x-ray sorry gamma, gamma radiation and, and because the process is slightly different you can even have coherent uh, EM radiation out and that tremendously increases the brightness of your source. So these free electron lasers, they are a more recent twist into, into uh, sources of, of uh, uh, short wavelength light. And it's nice because they can also be uh, coherent light sources. And otherwise, it would be quite difficult to realize these kind of light sources like, or, or this kind of radiation. But the... If you're interested, have a look in the Wikipedia of the kind of details, what kind of sources these are, or ask from me or the, the other teachers and teaching assistants in the course, and, and we will try our best to kind of explain about their details. Then the other regime, like I promised, okay, we also cover infrared radiation, and they're some of the most common ways of generating infrared light, radio antennas, heated filaments, so those those old-style light bulbs, thermal radiation in general, so this is how do you generate uh, infrared radiation, so basically every object, even me, I'm a source of radiation, although usually the wavelengths are quite low. Then thermal radiation is being used also in, in instruments, so remote controls, the, the, the signals, that we use to control our electrical devices in remote using remote controls. Essentially, it's it's thermal radiation. So there's a, a antennas that produce thermal light, thermal radiation inside the remote controls. And then, of course, mobile phones can be used to do same kind of things. And in general, when we think of a kind of a research topic in optics and photonics, uh, this is actually a big trend. Of, of developing new, cheaper, more efficient, brighter light sources. And, and this is very active and actually a large research topic in our field. So this is uh, maybe it's not the, the sexiest of research topics because in a way we're not trying to unravel new physics, but rather it's a kind of small grinding development of, of better light sources that will, of course, in the end be used to unravel new physics 
but the but the kind of our research point of view it may not be sounding that exotic so when we, people ask what you do I, okay i develop laser sources and new light sources it may not sound as fancy as uh, what do you do that okay I, I i try to do new physics come up with new physics but okay it's a matter of taste some people like it some people are more engineering like souls and and then they might be more happy in, in developing uh, new instrumentation and next, what we will do here in the, the kind of rest of the lecture is that we start going through the dipole radiation. And what is that and why it's so important and, and how does it look like? So at visible wavelengths, so basically we're now thinking about light sources, not just UV sources or infrared uh, radiation sources, but light sources. The most important source or, or type of, of radiator is an electric dipole source. Examples of such are, for example, a fluorescent molecule, it could be atomic, it could be a molecular emitter, it could be a quantum dot, and, and this would then give rise to light. And here, what we want to do, we want to be able to kind of answer questions when somebody would ask that they, how I could mathematically describe how this kind of uh, small molecule emits light. How does this radiation look like? And, and there, the answers then could be answered using the mathematical framework we will be showing to you next. And, and this is nice, because at the end of the day, uh, other larger light sources, for example, lasers, LEDs and such, how they work, we can, we can also understand as, as kind of being a bunch of dipole sources acting together. So then once we know how a single dipole source works, we can build up on from this, this kind of knowledge and then we can understand also more more macroscopic and, and more practical sources of light. So that's the motivation here. And, and this is how a dipole source looks like. So essentially we can think that we have a, a, a either like a one charge oscillating back and forth or we can imagine that we have a positive charge and negative charge so for example it could be the nucleus of an atom that's positively charged and then we have a single electron uh, could be for example like a conduction electron on a piece of a metal or, or it could be valence electron in a molecule and, and then this electron will be oscillating and that gives rise to electromagnetic radiation so dipole emitter essentially it consists of a positive and negative charges and, and they are separated by a given distance d from each other and the key point here is that they will oscillate with respect to each other most of the time like uh, the, the positive charge that will be the nucleus and that's super heavy compared to a single electron so that positive charge the nucleus won't be oscillating much or rather that will be still and it will be the, the electron that will be doing the, the uh, moving oscillation around and then when we have this kind of system this can be thought to be a dipole moment or, or giving rise to a dipole moment so that a small p dipole moment can be thought to be that it's the charge times the distance between the, the two different charges so this is a, a kind of math showing us how a dipole moment looks like and when the d oscillates then this dipole moment oscillates and then this dipole moment acts as a source of light. So Q is the amplitude of the charge, D is the distance vector between the charges, and most of the time the separation between the charges is smaller than lambda, and in this case it implies that the emitter is so-called point-like source. And when it's a point-like source, the emission pattern it can only have is an electric dipole-like radiation pattern, and that's it. So we do not even need to care about other types of radiation sources, as long as this approximation is okay. So that the, 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 our object that gives rise to radiation is small with respect to the wavelength of light. And now thinking about typical emitters, uh, molecules, atoms, quantum dots, they usually are quite small, like of the order of a nanometer or way smaller, so that then, then thinking about wavelengths of visible light ranging from 380 to 800 nanometers or so we see that this this uh, assumption is always valid and this implies that basically all the emitters we can easily come up with uh, are point-like objects point-like sources 
and then it is a mathematical necessity that their radiation pattern is exactly like an electric dipole like radiation source. If we would have something larger, then there would be so-called multipolar contributions into the radiation pattern, but those we do not need to care about, as long as the source is small. And that will be the case most of the time. Now, the electric dipole oscillates, like I mentioned, and if it oscillates harmonically with respect to time, mathematically essentially that means that the dipole moment P is of a form that we have some kind of amplitude for the dipole moment P0, that's a constant vector, and then we have time harmonic oscillation. And, and this is the guy that acts as the source of electromagnetic radiation. We plug this kind of uh, uh, emitter as, as the J, and that gives rise to electromagnetic radiation. We have highlighted in the figure what happens most of the time, so that, the, for example, this could be the positive massive nucleus of an atom emitter, and then the minus sign here, this corresponds to the, the conduction electron or valence electron that oscillates with respect to time here. And if you would want to really calculate from, from, from the basics, so, so from the kind of Maxwell's equations and, and the wave, equa wave equation, how this radiation pattern would actually look like, it won't be a trivial Darth task. Uh, why, why it won't be a trivial task? Well, if especially if you would want to consider the fields near the dipole, so-called near field, uh, they are complicated in form. And the strange thing about them that there's also a non-propagating field components inside these near fields, so that they, they, it doesn't even look like a kind of conventional radiating light. If, if you're interested in learning more about this, like uh, you could, for example, try to look at an emission pattern of an electric dipole and, and look it into the direction in which the electric dipole oscillates. So if, if the electric dipole oscillates along Z, if you would look at the near field nearby the Z direction, then you would see that the, there will be a field, but it won't be a propagating field. So strange things happen when you are in the near field. The field of far away from the source, this is the so-called far field. And this is also known as the radiation zone or radiation field. And this one is way simpler in description. So we can even approximate that in using a scalar valued function so that the electric field with respect to three coordinates R, theta and T, I will show a figure later what, how, the, how we define R and theta, is of a form that we have the amplitude of the dipole moment P0 times K squared times sine of theta divided by 4 pi epsilon naught, and then we have a functional formula for a spherical wave. So exponent IKR minus omega T divided by R. So here, P0 is the amplitude of the dipole moment, and then K, of course, is the, the amplitude of the wave vector, so omega divided by C. And, and, and we do not derive the form of this, but of course we could look, put a, a, a point-like source into the wave equation and then try to see uh, how it would look like, what kind of radiation pattern it would look like, but the, this is a task that we deem is beyond our scope of this course. But you can find derivations from the books. For example, Jackson's classical electrodynamics book will, will show you the truth, how it can be done. So if you're really interested, have a look on the literature. Now we have this functional formula, uh, sorry, functional form for our dipole radiation pattern. And uh, how, how this looks like is that there we have the original a spherical wave contribution, that's the latter term, highlighted in blue. And then we have the, the first term. And the first term tells us that the radiation is really most intense along the direction where, which is perpendicular to the dipole moment. So basically, this is what I wanted to say. And, and, and it comes from the fact that we define the theta as the angle with respect to the direction of the dipole moment here, the dipole moment points along Z. And since we have the sine theta relation here, if we would be looking at the radiation perfectly along the Z direction, we would get zero because of this term here. And when we are looking at the radiation along the Y direction or X direction, so we are looking at the radiation in the XY plane, this sine theta term is maximized. So in essence, in essence, uh, the, the field looks like something, something like a donut propagating 
from the center of Origo here, so that there will be an empty, uh, no radiation along the Z direction, and the emission is maximized along the XY plane. And of course, we can calculate just directly, since we have the function for the electric field, that what is the irradiance distribution like uh, from this electric dipole source. And we can just directly calculate that to be, and now we do not need to worry about the time dependence. <clears throat> that will be uh, P0 squared angular frequency to the power of 4 divided by 32 times pi squared times speed of light c to the power of 3 times permittivity naught. So, sorry, uh, vacuum permittivity epsilon naught. And then we have the, the sine squared theta per r squared uh, term, which tells us how, how does the radiation actually look like. So this is not surprising, r squared uh, inverse dependence, so that the intensity goes down when we go further and further off, and here we have a pretty strong uh, dependent, uh, dependence on the angle theta. So, looking at this, we see that the, the, our irradiance depends on the fourth power of the angular frequency, so just looking at this angular frequency omega equals kc so 2 times pi times c divided by lambda so we see that when we are at the shorter wavelengths uh, light is being scattered quite strongly and, and and even though here we are thinking of 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 this as an equation giving us a intense irradiance distribution of a source same kind of functional form applies for a light that is being scattered by a small object. So essentially, like then these kind of uh, equations would, for example, explain to us why our sky looks blue. And, and the reason is because the blue light, uh, blue wavelengths are being scattered more strongly uh, into our eyes. So, so sun, the, the nearby star, is radiating a lot of different colors and, and then the kind of light that would be going through and not hitting our eyes is being scattered by air molecules. The different kind of molecules in our air is a gas mixture. So what is an air molecule? Well, like, I don't know, it could be oxygen, nitrogen, whatever. So, <clears throat> so uh, that is then being scattered towards our eye. And, and since blue light is being scattered more strongly, then, then that makes the, the coloration of sky blue. And then, of course, during the sunset, things start looking differently because then we are getting more direct radiation from the sun into our eyes. And then, in fact, why we are not seeing blue anymore during the sunrise and sunset is that there, since blue light is being scattered more strongly, then then that is actually being being scattered into other directions. And it's mostly the, the red light that goes through unperturbed, unscattered into our eyes. So that's the, for example, motivation or explanation on, on, on why sky is blue and why sunsets look so beautiful to us. So this is, in a nutshell, what I wanted to say to you during this lecture. So I wanted to point to you that the, the electromagnetic radiation, there are always some kind of sources that give rise to it. And we have now gone through the kind of main sources of, of different kinds of electromagnetic radiation. And then we have gone through the math and an introduction into the dipole radiation and how an electric dipole emitter looks like. And, and even though we are speaking of emitters here, please acknowledge the fact that when particles scatter light or any kind of objects scatter light, their scattering profile also looks like something similar. So that then we can understand actually quite a bit of things by just looking at these equations we have introduced although not derived. So I thank you for your patience and I hope you enjoyed the lecture. And in the next lecture, that will be the final lecture on this chapter, we will be speaking about light in matter. So essentially I will be uh, speaking about the macroscopic Maxwell's equations. So I will be speaking what happens for light when it's actually entering a, a homogeneous medium and, and interesting things will happen there. Please stay tuned and thanks for listening. Bye bye.